Welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined by two developers of the Jitsi project. And we are going to talk about what Jitsi is, why you should care about it first. Um, and towards the end of the show, we will discuss some of the origins of this fascinating company and uh, these two gentlemen. Uh, I'm happy to be joined by Emil and Saul. Uh, welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. How are you guys doing? Uh, hey, Gabe. Nice to nice to meet you. Nice to be on this podcast. Uh, thank you for for having us. We're doing great. How are you? I'm doing just fine. I'm doing really good. It's it's a pleasure these days to be able to talk to uh, excellent people producing uh, fabulous stuff. And I want to start for those who maybe are not familiar with uh, Jitsi and particularly Jitsi Meet. And I just want to give a kind of a snapshot to give people a, a picture of of what we're talking about here. So uh, it's a it's a website. Um, that you would go to meet, M-E-E-T dot JIT, J-I-T dot S-I, uh, Jitsi Meet, you can search for it. And what happens is you will arrive at a screen, you will type in a name for the room, and that's it, you're in a room. And you're now in a program that, a service that basically has the same features as Zoom or Skype, uh, but it's a it's a uh, open source project and similar quality, no registration needed, no information that you have to give, at no cost and end to end encryption in, in a true sense that we will discuss. It's kind of fabulous for privacy seekers. And of course, at that point, you probably have a lot of questions, right? What's the history of this project? How much work has gone into it? Why isn't it asking me to register something? You know, how secure is the end to end encryption? We'll get into this stuff. Um, but maybe the biggest question that people have, and I know it's a bit crass, but let's just get that question out of the way for the community the privacy community that has learned that if the product is free, then you are the product. Um, how is a piece of tech as impressive as Jitsi Meet free? Ha. Well, uh, the short answer is because the people who develop it really care for it to be free. And we also have to get a little bit into the what does free mean, right? Because there's um, the service that you just pointed to, meet.jit.c. Well, that's free. <clears throat> that's probably the most um, a noticeable component because it actually takes a lot of money to run this. Uh, but there's also, you mentioned this is an open source project, which means that all the code out there is free as well. You can go and download all of it and run it on your own server. And many people do that and have your own meeting service and uh, change it a little bit and have it be the way that you want it to be. And similar projects have existed. Some of them have, have faded away. Some of them have gone to more private means of existence. And we have been fortunate enough to to have a team where everyone cares and to work with companies uh, where continuing to do so open source and freely has been possible. We can dive a little bit about into the, well, how do you make it work? Who pays the bill? Why do they pay the bill? Are people trading with your data sort of stuff? The, the gist of the answer is it's free because the people who work on it really, really, really want it to be free. Uh, there's a there's a separate company uh, or or kind of a co company with Jitsi that has a paid service and that is what w foots the bill. So there's no user data being sold and and et cetera. Is that is that a good summary? Uh, that is correct. There's no user data being sold. In fact, you know, uh, there's rarely user data being sold the way that people think about this. Usually, it's more about you know people are trying to get um, you know sell people's attention. Right, I'm 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 going to give you my service for free, but in exchange, I'm going to put stuff in front of your eyes, uh, and I'm maybe going to target that stuff in specific ways. But we don't do that either. Uh, well, actually, that's that's uh, not entirely true. At the end of every Me Jitsi call, if you're having it on the platform that we pay for, where we pay for the servers, at the end of every such call, you will see a screen that tells you about our paid service. Um, so we do abuse your attention, um, hopefully just a little bit at the end of every call. Uh, so uh, to clear up another confusion, uh, a lot of people, what we're, what I'm kind of interested in, in, in this conversation is Jitsi Meet, which is, the, which is the, the free conferencing software that we've mentioned. Um, but that's not all there is to Jitsi. What is Jitsi besides Jitsi Meet? Uh, that, that, that's probably one of the trickiest parts about Jitsi, understanding wh what exactly it is. Uh, so that's a great question. Um, ultimately, um, I think your original explanation is, is almost entirely correct. It is what you get on meet.jitsi, 
And it's also the software that lets you reproduce this entire thing elsewhere. Now, this entire thing is not just the bit that lets you get onto a page and see the video of other people. Uh, although there's already multiple subcomponents there, you know, there's the router that actually gets the video packets from one participant to the other. There's the bit that serves you the, uh, the, the app itself. But then there are also other components that let you connect to the telephone network so that you can have telephone participants join into your call. There's the bit that lets you record a call um, if you choose to. There's the bit that lets you stream a call to YouTube. There's the bit that lets you, um, you know, allocate telephone codes to, to, to meetings. There's all sorts of things that you might want to do within a meeting. All of them are configured and running as part of Meet Jitsi, but they're all also separate software projects so that when you are creating your own video deployment, um, you can have it match completely what's currently available in Meet Jitsi. Did that make sense? That does make sense. So uh, what, what I described, the, the scenario I described earlier where you go to the website, that means that you are using uh, their servers for your instance of Jitsi. You can self-host, we'll ask about that. Uh, in a moment, and I wanted to kind of start one of the most one one of the things that my audience will say from the beginning is, well, what I need as a baseline for private communication for me to be using it is end to end encryption. By which they mean I don't want anybody besides me and the recipient to have access to what was going on. And I wonder if you could talk about end to end encryption. How is that term used misleadingly today? And how does Jitsi use that term? Let's do this. So um, you s summarize the expectation of end-to-end -end encryption uh, pretty clearly. It is, I want to have a conversation with Gabe, and I want no one else other than me and Gabe to hear this conversation. Um, and you know, in certain cases, I might be okay for other people to listen. Like in this case, there will be thousands of people that are going to listen to this conversation. But I also want when I um, need a private conversation, I, I want to have a way to have it. So end-to-end um, -end encryption used to be a way that allowed people to do that. that if, you, if you would recall, I'm, I'm sure that um, most of the people on this podcast, uh, certainly me, first got um, exposed to end-to-end -to -end encryption in the context of email. And the idea was... I'm going to have something as part of my email client that you know mumbles the, the the email message that I have, and that same thing is going to run on the client of my email recipient, and it's going to decrypt the the message, and um, it's also going to certify that no one between the sender and me has been able to access this message. Now, this part with certifying that no one has been able to read that message is extremely important. That's one of the uh, one of the things that people don't really uh, always think about when they talk about encryption is that, you know, mumbling stuff is not so hard. You know, we can pick any um, password, any long code and and just use it as a way to encrypt a message. And you know, it's fairly it's fairly good protection. The main problem that you have when you do this is, well, how do I know that when I'm picking the password, the person that I'm picking it with is the one that I'm supposed to talk to and not someone impersonating that person? So let's let's be a little bit more specific. If you and I, Gabe, are using Gmail um, and, and we want to exchange an encrypted uh, set of messages, what, we, what we're trying to, what we're concerned about is potentially... Google not being able to read our messages, right? The way that we would go about it is that we would, let's say, use Mozilla Thunderbird with some sort of a PGP extension or, or, or something like that. Um, and uh, that extension would encode our email messages. And it would also tell us the message is fine. The message that Gabe received from email is fine. There's, uh, you know, no one has interfered with it. This also tells you um, that, um, you know, I'm kind of mixing the concepts between how video conferencing works and how email works, but ultimately uh, it's th the same intention. You want to have some way of validating the authenticity of the person that you're talking to. Now, the way that um, this gets distorted nowadays is that this entire model relies 
on the fact that whoever deals with your encryption is different from the entity that provides you with the service, right? So if we are using Gmail, it is paramount that whatever does our encryption does not come from Google. If it came from Google, then the thing that tells you it's all right, nothing with in your message has been tampered with, that claim, it might be true, but it certainly does not increase, it does not increase the, the sorry, it does not decrease the amount of trust that you have to put into Google. You know, it will be exactly equivalent or uh, to, to, to have Google tell you, hey, we are not reading your messages without end-to-end -end encryption because you're still, in both cases, you just have to trust Google's word that they're not doing with your messages anything that you don't want them to do. Right, that that um, if 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 your end-to-end -end encryption is going to come from the same entity that provides you with the service, you lose that uh, you know um, that advantage. You're still having to trust your provider. Now, the reason that end-to-end um, -end encryption has been distorted today, as I started to say, is that people have kind of latched onto the uh, name end-to-end -end encryption as some sort of a brand of of privacy. But what happens? Let's let's say that we take we take a bunch of the actors that provide end-to-end -end encryption today, including uh, Jitsi, but also Zoom and Google Duo and WhatsApp. In all of these cases, well, Jitsi is kind of an, an exception here, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about exactly how it is an exception. But uh, in all of these cases, you have something in the software that is telling you this conversation is encrypted. And, and that software comes from the same entity that is providing you with the service. Like in the case of WhatsApp, Every, every time I open a chat in WhatsApp and it says, you know, this conversation is now end-to-end -end encrypted, says who? Says Facebook. Who is Facebook? Well, it's the entity that I'm trying not to have to trust in this case. And they're the ones that are telling me this is end-to-end -end encrypted. I'm taking their word for it. So the question is, if I'm going to trust them that this really is end-to-end -end encrypted, why am I not trusting them in the first place when they're telling me, hey, we're not reading your messages? The only way to not have to fall into that trap is to either go back to the old model where the, the software that you use to communicate is different from the entity that provides you with the service. And that's kind of hard these days, right? You're, um, we live in a cloud world. Um, for the better, you don't have to mess with configuring email clients to different servers and they have all these weird settings and all these... You have to understand port numbers and protocols and TLS versions and, 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 and all these things. For the better, we don't have to do that anymore. But that's also because um, you, all of your means of communication come from, from the same entity. So they're pre-configured to work exactly as they need to be working. So um, going stepping back from this is going to come at the cost of a lot of user friction. Your, your um, other option is to have someone that you trust, and that might be yourself, become your uh, service provider. So this is what, for example, Jitsi allows you to do. Jitsi makes it very easy for people, uh, let's say you have uh, some, some you know, small group of people that, uh, that often have to communicate um, and that might have something sensitive to say, or maybe they, are, they just care a lot about their conversations being private. One of them goes and says, well, that's okay. I'm going to go and install a Jitsi server for us and that's going to take him or her 15 minutes. And, at, at, at the end of that, the, the people on the call know that they don't have to trust anyone else um, and, and that whoever installed the server is the only you know, um, master of the privacy of that conversation. If you want privacy such that no one else except you and your contacts are able to hear the conversation, then yes. With Jitsi, the best way to do that is by running your own instance. If, if now, if you... The way that you phrased it was, if you want end-to-end -end encryption to be to be doing that for you, then the answer to that is different, right? The the if if you want end-to-end -end encryption to be providing that guarantee, then the software that says this is a secure conversation has to come from someone else, other than the entity that is providing you with the service. Let me put it this way: when you you when you do when you do email, okay. Um, you go you, today. Most people would just go to Gmail and they would type a message and and they would send it. And the question is, can Google read this message that I just sent to you over Gmail? 
if Google were to say, we don't read the, your messages, you might choose to trust them, or you may think, well, I don't know if that's true. Now, imagine that you have this doubt. I don't know if that's true, Google. I don't know if I believe you that you're not reading my messages. Let's say that Google come and say, starting today, your messages are end-to-end -end encrypted and we can't read them anymore. Does that make you feel better? What has changed? Nothing has really changed. You still have to trust the same entity telling you that now they've added another hoop internally, supposedly, that prevents them from reading your messages. But if they wanted to lie to you, it's still possible. So it's not entirely clear why you would trust them in one situation and not in the other. If you want end-to-end -end encryption in that, in that scenario to be providing you with a solution, the thing that tells you your conversation has to be end-to-end -end encrypted cannot come from Google. It, can come, it has to come from someone else. It has to come from Mozilla, Thunderbird, or it has to come from some party providing you with an email client that encrypts, that is responsible for the encryption, and that has nothing to do with Google. It's like saying, well, we're going to let corporations tax audit themselves, right? We tax audited it ourselves. We're paying, we're paying everything. It's all good, right? That doesn't make sense. The end-to-end -end encryption uh, has this auditing function that it, it is paramount for auditing functions to be performed by entities other than the one that's being audited. Well, presumably the difference between Google and Jitsi is that we can read the code for one of them. How, how does a company, for example, like Signal offer end-to-end -end encryption? I, my understanding is that we, we trust that because we can, we can see it ourselves. Um, what am I missing here? That's the, you're, 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 the, you're missing the fact that um, you, can, you can see the code. Uh, I, I want to be careful here because at no point do I mean to allege that uh, anyone is doing anything fishy. In fact, I'm um, rather comfortable that if when I use, uh, for example, Google for messages, um, they aren't actually reading my messages. Uh, I, I, the, the culture of, of companies in, in the Silicon Valley currently is such that all of them treat user data as absolutely sacred. And anyone needing to access data, even remotely, um, has to jump through an impossible number of hoops um, to, to, to implement any functionality uh, around user data. So I'm not suggesting that any uh, anything there is um, is actually being done, but we're discussing the possibility. Let's say that you had a rogue actor there or something um, who would have the option to, to do it. So if you take Signal or the Meet Jitsi service, you see the open source code indeed. You know, everything is open source, but the thing that runs on Signal servers, the thing that you download from the App Store uh, with Signal, you don't really have a good way of knowing whether that thing is the exact same code that was running, that, that, that it was able to see in the open source repository, or whether something else has been added to it. So in theory, it is very possible um, for anyone running uh, a, a video service from an open source project to go and say, well, okay, I'm, I'm just going to add a little thing here that clones all the data and sends it to my private repository. If you want to trust the open sourceness of a project, then in order for that to have value, you have to have compiled the code yourself and you have to, have, you have to be running the result of that compilation yourself. No, I just I just wanted to reiterate that in, indeed it is a matter of trust. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, Signal has this this reputation, of course, right? So if they would do something fishy, that would, you know, sabotage their whole thing. But if we're talking about, hey, uh, uh, let's have a phone call, but we need to make sure it's end-to-end -end encrypted. If someone would suggest WhatsApp, people would be like, well, no, that's my faith but it's end-to-end -end encrypted. So the trust is really important because you can't verify it. Um, you know, like the, the, the little phrase that goes around with trust, but verify. You can't verify. That's the problem. But if you download the source code for the mobile app, for the server, you compile both, you run both, and this is very easy to do, in our case at least, um, you can actually trust and verify 
because you can see that what runs on your thing is what you're looking at in the source code. So you're sure if you want to take a look at the code and make sure, okay, so this, the way they do it sounds good to me. Uh, that is indeed what you're running. So this is, I mean, it's a little bit of a stretch, if you will, like, because that, that in this model, you would need to be suspect of everything, right? But I think it is, it's an important distinction to make because of what Emil said. If now end-to-end -end encryption has been, uh, it's a term that has become too mainstream. I think I heard that they want to make Instagram DMs end-to-end -end encrypted. Like, what does that even accomplish? Um, now, in a, and a video conference is also a slightly different medium than what the general end-to-end -end encryption has been applying, uh, has applied to up until now, which is a lot of, you know, chat messages and things of the sort, which are stored somewhere and replayed over and over, right? So it is important um, because there's a track that you're leaving, right? In, in a video conference, it is something that happens while you're in there. When you're not in there, nothing happens. So there's, there's a little bit of an immediacy part of it that makes the model of a video conference, in my mind at least, is slightly different than, than the way chat clients work. And there are other properties uh, that you may or may not want um, to, to have, like, for example, uh, plausible deniability. You may want to say, well, I wasn't there. And well, there are ways to tell that you have been there. Uh, because, well, your keys were used here. We can't see what you said, but we know it was you. Uh, so th th there is a lot of, a lot of nuance in, in, in that. So that's why, uh, that's why we think that the best way in which you can be sure of what runs is, is what you think it runs is if you run it yourself. That way you don't need to trust anyone but you. Maybe I could ask the question in this way, if you're willing to answer, this is the this is the traditional kind of privacy question. Let's say that um, law enforcement issued a subpoena to Jitsi and they said, we have this IP address. Um, this person has been using Jitsi Meet. We'd like to know what you have on them. And they'll also be having a conversation, we think, in an hour. So we'd like to know about that. Um, what 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 would Jitsi be able to provide about that? No, we are we are willing to answer it. And um, there's, there's a part of it that where you would have to take my word for it and a part of it where uh, you won't. So um, first, the answer to your question is uh, nothing. We wouldn't be able to say anything at this point. Um, we uh, used to, uh, in the past, uh, we used to store IP addresses so that we can analyze the nature of the origin of traffic on our service so that we can dimension it properly. This is no longer the case. We don't even... Uh, keep IP addresses around. So we can't even tell you, like if you, you, usually, because bad stuff does happen, you know. Uh, we would get reports from law enforcement in different countries and they would say, you know, some bad stuff. And I don't want to go into details, but let's say that I'm 100% positive that no one listening to this podcast would have a problem labeling the sort of stuff that we hear about as, as really bad stuff. So... Um, Come here comes uh, some law enforcement representative and says, uh, "At this link, we have a report that this and this sort of activity occurred." We want to have usually the the you know um, so these services are overwhelmed. They haven't spent too much time looking into the service, and they would say, "We want to have their usernames, their you know the usual connection times, and we want to uh, we want to get their IP addresses, their full names, their billing information, and and all of that." Um, well. Um, First, any user of me, Jitsi, can see that we are not able to provide this information because we never ask you for it. We don't ask for your billing information. We don't ask for your address. We don't ask for um, uh, your your full name. You can enter some sort of a display name that you want to, to choose with other people. Whatever you put in there um, is the only thing that you give us. We don't store that, um, but you know, that's the only thing that it, it reaches us. We are not able to provide any recordings. We're not able to schedule recordings based on demand. We do not have the ability to do any of these things. And that is entirely independent of whether or not you have enabled end-to-end -end encryption for, for that call. 
Excellent. Well, I appreciate you answering that. And I know we spent some time on the end-to-end -end encryption. That's it's an important topic. And I'll link some articles that the Jitsi team has written about the complexity of end-to-end -end encryption. It's certainly worth thinking about this and reading about it, especially considering how often that phrase is is thrown around. And uh, now that we got the kind of the difficult question out of the way, are there any other other kinds of privacy features that one could use in Jitsi Meet? And you know, how how could we lock it down even further? One of the first things that we have to get out of the way when, when that question is, is asked in order to be a minimum productive is what sort of privacy for who? If what we're talking about is imagine the Edward Snowden situation from a few years ago where he left the country and he wanted to have discussions with uh, journalists uh, and he wanted, um, and I, at least when we saw the movie uh, about it, they were kind of going and putting, putting pillows in front of the door so that no one can be... Uh, trying to get anything from from the crack under the door or something like that. Um, that's the sort of situation where you would want <clears throat> um, to be uh, to to have some some private ser server somewhere. Y you'd like uh, uh, people to go in there and and not put their names in it. And um, Jitsi lets you do that brilliantly today. I think that's the in terms of video conferencing. This is the easiest i'm not even aware of another one but um i think it's by far the easiest way to to achieve that level of privacy now there's other sorts of privacy that become very nuanced depending on who wants them uh who, who wants the privacy for example if you take a company that runs its own video conferencing server they would be very concerned with we don't want our competition to be able to hear what's going on um so they'd be very concerned with not so much with who's hosting the service. They'd be very concerned that they don't want no one else to get into the meetings, right? So things like having a lobby, um, you know, uh, before the meeting so that people have to be let into the conference, um, uh, having a password to protect the, the room, having some sort of a very random URL uh, that, that, makes it, that makes the meeting hard to find. All of these things are important then uh, to protect you from other outsiders, this is all achievable with Jitsi. Now, in that scenario, the company might have nothing against they themselves eavesdropping on conversations, right? Um, and uh, they might have nothing. They might even want to record every... In fact, they're, in many cases, like if you take the financial industry, uh, they are actually, in many cases, obligated to record the conversation so that it's available for later auditing. So you get into this situation where it's extremely private with regard to some entities, and then not private at all w w from, from another perspective. You know, every conversation being recorded certainly doesn't sound as private enough to any of us, but to someone in the financial industry, like, yeah, it's my company recording it, that's fine, as long as no, no one in the competition is, is hearing me, that's, that's fine. And someone that takes um, uh, Jitsi can configure it to run that way. Uh, and by default, we show all of this, you know, to people, you know, that this call is being recorded, so that at least it's not mismatching your expectations. Um, but we also can't guarantee that if someone takes the code and it makes you use their version of the service, we can't guarantee what they have done to the code and whether they've changed it or not um, in, in some case. So it's between you and whoever's providing you with the, well, with a video conferencing service. Right. Uh, we also let you, it might be, if we're talking about privacy, the privacy of your home, um, you might not want to see people to see what's behind you, what books are on your shelves, uh, or the mess that's in your room, well, then you have to use something like background blurring, which which you also which you also provide. It's always uh, so we do try to satisfy as many privacy constraints as possible for for different people, but they are different sets for for different that, people. That's fair enough, and I do want to emphasize to people that one of the reasons why I'm glad to be talking to Jitsi and why I recommend it is, I mean, it checks the boxes of of what we want uh, as privacy seekers, and it's incredibly convenient. I see it as basically a, a complete replacement to the big tech conferencing options. And I want to kind of walk through what how I use this. And I just want to see if, if I have this right or if I'm missing anything. So let's say I don't want to self-host. I just go to the Jitsi Meet website. I, I create a name for the meeting, which I generate from my password manager. So 100 characters, random, random characters, uh, because the URL is the link to the meeting, um, which is incredibly convenient, but also a risk. So I have that random name. You can also create a password within the 
one, once you're inside of the room, you can create a password for your guest. And then once you're in there, you can do all the normal stuff, right? You can invite people via email for more professionalism. You can record, including video. You can live stream. You can change performance settings, change the background, chat, screen share. You can have many people in a meeting. Uh, basically, you can do all the things you need to do for a conferencing software. Um, so just kind of stopping right there. Have, have I missed anything important or mischaracterized anything in how I basically use it? No, that sounds that sounds really good. There is one more thing uh, you could be doing, um, but it depends a little bit of, of the type of of people you're meeting with. So one of the of the if you will special things that the this, this specific deployment so meet.g.si has is the fact that everybody is a moderator. And that comes with its advantages and disadvantages. So if you disappear, somebody else can take care of the meeting. Uh, but that also means that if you happen to be in a setting where there are some adversarial participants, they can also cause disruption. We do have a thing uh, that we don't really make a lot of noise about, but it's actually on the on the on the front page of Mijitsi, which is a moderated meeting. In a moderated meeting, we generate the meeting names. They are UID for meetings. And you get two links. One, it's only for yourself. And it includes uh, a JWT token. And the other one is the one you distribute. And the, the link you have will give you moderator rights. And the one you distribute will not give moderator rights to all the other people. So depending on the setting you're in, this might be something that you could use to make it not necessarily more private, but a little bit, you would be more in control of it, if you will. Yeah, that, that's that's great. I, I didn't realize that was an option. Definitely something you would want to consider, especially if you're having sensitive client meetings or, or anything like this. Also consider for the listeners, if you're sending a link and a password using your email service, well, you know, you're, you're kind of giving the keys to the kingdom to your email service and, and all their vulnerabilities. So maybe you give the link to them one way and you give them the password another way, just little things to consider. Um, I wanted to ask kind of a, a, a few follow-up questions, especially about the the naming. If I were to create, I haven't tried this, if I were to create a Jitsi room and just call it Jitsi, um, presumably I could expect random people throughout the day to join something with such a common uh, name. Uh, what am I missing in that? Most likely, yes. Yeah, vanity names have that, that problem, that's why. Uh, we have the random room name generator, which uh, I think it should give you the same amount of, uh, you know, the strength against collisions than the one you generate with the password manager, but it has a slightly more memorable names because there are four random words out of our list of I don't know how many. If I recall correctly, there is one trillion combinations or thereabouts. So the chances of, uh, of a random collision are slim to none now if you choose like my meeting test one two three and things like that of course uh, there is a higher chance one uh, extra feature quote unquote um, that can also be used to mitigate this a little bit is that you can use uh, extra paths in the url in in that specific deployment so you can do you know meet.g.si slash you know Gabe slash my meeting one two three, and that's different than just a slash my meeting one two three because it's got Gabe in front of it. So um, with this, you can also create this like you know different URLs that have a little bit more you know meaning to you, if you will. Um, but yes, generally speaking, because the meeting name is in the URL, you need to make sure that it is unique enough that there is not a a random collision so that, you know, Joe random joins your meeting by accident. But assuming that you schedule your meeting, um, of course, you can then turn on protection for your room because rooms are ephemeral. So when there's nobody in there, they get destroyed. And anything you, uh, all the chat messages that you exchange in them, they're gone. All the, you know, settings that you set in there, they're gone. Everything is gone. But once you're in, you can enable two things to do your uh, authorization or your, your control of the people who can join. Uh, one of them is you can set a password. This has the um, 
as, as, as you properly mentioned earlier, has the disadvantage, if you will, that you need to communicate this password to the people in an out-of-band way, somehow in a way that's not correlated with this meeting so that it wouldn't be so easy to have both pieces of information in a single place. And the other one, which we think is as useful but easier to use is the lobby. If you turn on the lobby, people need to, well, virtually knock knock into your meeting. And so if you pair this with um, the moderated meeting where you are the only moderator, you are the only one who is able to let people in once you turn on the lobby. Turn on the lobby, they need to knock knock when they come in and then you let them in. If it turns out that the person who joins is causing trouble, uh, you can kick them out and then not admit them again. No, I, I like all these extra features. And let's say you are in a hurry, just start up your password manager and generate a, a, a long random character and at least use that as your name, if, if nothing else. That, that's certainly a, a, base, a baseline to do. I, I wonder, um, speaking of recording, as you said, uh, people can record Jitsi and everybody has moderator powers by default. Where are these recordings stored and how should we think about that as, as privacy interested people? So that's a very interesting question because, um, well, so yes, moderators can record. And the way it used to work up until very recently is that uh, we had an integration with Dropbox. And what would essentially happen is we would have a server join the meeting, record what the what it saw. So essentially, the server that joins is uh, sees the meeting as another participant. And we have this functionality called follow me. So you can actually do actions and the recorder and other participants will follow. So like focusing on one participant or another participant. So you can kind of control how that uh, recording uh, happens. And then uh, the end, once the recording ends, we will upload it to the Dropbox that, that, that got signed in, right? Now, um, when a recording starts, you get an audible cue and you also get an indicator in the user interface. So if for some reason you don't want to be part of this meeting anymore, you will have, uh, oh, and there's a notification. So there's like three cues that will, all the bells and whistles that will tell you, hey, this has been recorded. So. FYI. Um, now, recently, we switched away from this model to a one uh, that we think is better. And it, it also uh, saves us that little bit of infrastructure, which is local recordings. Um, we, uh, we, have, we actually have, uh, um, we're going to publish it in, in the blog soon, but it has been out for a few weeks now. And this feature allows you to, you as a participant in the meeting, you can record the meeting and it will be recorded directly into your hard drive. What we record is the tab, the output of the tab. Um, currently, only Chromium-based browsers allow us to do that, but you can imagine it as recording the output, both uh, um, the, the video of a given tab, which is the tab where the meeting is happening, and we're gonna record it and save it into your hard drive. Now, of course, the implications of the, the privacy implications of recording meetings, um, I have a little bit of a, my, my take on it is that there's so many ways in which your meeting can be recorded without you knowing that we, at least I try not to make strong statements about it because it's impossible to guarantee. I could have a phone close to my speakers recording everything and you will never know. So the fact that I show an icon when I start the recording is, well, yeah, that means my server is recording, but it doesn't say much. You could use any tool in your computer to record the, the screen output and everything. So no matter how encrypted your call is, uh, it can still be recorded by an insider. So if you're, if you're in a meeting and you're discussing some sensitive topics, I think that there needs to there's got to be this this trust that we've been talking about again but in a different in a different space because just by being there people have the ability to record whatever's happening whether with the tools we provide or with external tools which would make it not visible with the tools we provide we will give you audio uh, sorry visual and audible cues so that participants in the meeting know 
that those actions are, are about to happen. I want to ask you guys this question. I think a lot of people in the privacy community, um, their biggest fear of any conferencing software is that screen share button. And that's led people like me to just use an entirely boot up an entirely different operating system with nothing on it when using certain uh, conferencing software. And I've had people ask me, and I guess I didn't have a good answer to them, if the capacity to screen share, which exists in Jitsi as well, is there, um, does that mean that the software, is it possible that that company could be viewing our screen without us having pressed that button? You know, that's a very interesting question because um, uh, it, it, um, it, we will tie this back into end-to-end encryption in an unexpected way. Um, let's, let's answer your question like this. If, so any application that runs on your computer could be recording your screen. Some operating systems would tell you when that happens, but you might not notice, and some operating systems won't even tell you that this is happening. So any rich application that does that, uh, rich client, the thing that you installed on your desktop could be doing this, regardless of when you've pressed your, the button. Now, the interesting part here happens in applications that run in a browser. Because what you start having in the browser is something similar to what you have with the old end-to-end -end encryption trust model. The entity, there are two entities involved. There's the entity that is providing you the service. Let's say that this is Jitsi, or let's say that you're using Google Meet. Um, well, Google Meet are a peculiar case, but let's say that you're using the web version of Zoom. And, and, and then there's the entity that is providing you with the browser. So the thing that runs in the browser cannot do anything that the browser does not allow it to do. As long as you didn't install binaries on your computer, whatever runs in a browser tab is limited by the laws of the browser. So um, nothing that runs in a browser tab can circumvent the, the, these laws of the browser and, and, and it cannot record things unless you have explicitly authorized it to capture your screen. So um, that's one way where you could get extra confidence. That's one of the, you know, the, the, the beauties of the web is that you have this um, you know, shared environment that runs um, uh, where you can kind of learn to, to understand how it in, operates and then your expectations will always be matched. Anything that loads in a browser tab will not be able to record unless you have explicitly authorized it. In fact, they've gotten a lot more stingy with that. So um, this was changed recently, but you now need to have a user gesture begin the screen recording. So you cannot do it programmatically. It needs to come from a button click, um, let's say, or something like that. So it's you, you couldn't have a process that does it in the background. Well, actually, and even when you when you could, right, on, on the browser, uh, even... Uh, I, I don't recall when it was possible to do it without a user gesture, but it would still take you to the dialogue that asks you, "Well, what am I supposed yeah. to? What am I supposed to share? Uh, do you want the entire screen?" Or and and then you're going to have to have an an explicit user agreement at that point, even in even in that old world. Now, uh, what Sue is talking about now is that you wouldn't even be shown uh, sh shown the dialogue um, unless you clicked on something. Um, you 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 triggered an action, and only then would the browser allow the app that it runs to ask the question, to even ask the question: Am I, uh, you know, am I allowed to share your screen? And which part of your screen would you like me to share? And then there's of course the operating system uh, barrier itself, which, as Emil mentioned, some of them ask and some of them don't. Mac OS, for example, will ask you. It's like, hey. Uh, you need to grant this permission. And in fact, it will require a, re a restart of the browser. So this action is, is really annoying. So uh, I do see the point of, of, of that paranoia, but I don't think, um, and I, I will say one thing. I think running these kinds of applications in the browser is the right way to go because there we have this separation. You're running the software from a company in the confinements of the sandbox of a different company. So 
You might be running your meeting coming from Jitsi or 8x8 in the browser coming from Google or Mozilla. So it's the, the, the incentives of these two companies are different. Like we would need to be co-conspirators if we want to get your screen sent to our servers or something. And that's not really going to happen, is it? Well, that's that's fabulous knowledge and, and good advice. Uh, you know, I always told people and always do run in a browser. And of course, people like companies like Zoom don't like that. They you have to click multiple times, uh, basically cancel for for you to even get that option in the browser. So that's interesting. But that's fabulous information. I'm <laughs> I'm very pleased to be talking to you two guys who who know so much about this. I I, I want to move in our final maybe ten minutes here to the company of Jitsi. You guys are very knowledgeable. You've been working at this a long time. This is a passion project. This is a fantastic contribution to communication in the world. And I want to ask you about the the origins of Jitsi. You've talked about it. You have a uh, you have a podcast called um, 20 Years of Real-Time Communications Jitsi. I'll link that in the chat. You can kind of see a little bit more about this. But uh, on, a, on a basic level, I, I want to ask about the origins of the company. And, and I want to do it in this way. A lot of people say, "Well, you know, why aren't why aren't there more privacy services out there?" And it's because it's it's difficult, uh, especially something like Jitsi that has video. And I can't imagine how much uh, how many servers are required just to be able to run that, especially so so seamlessly. Could you tell us a, a bit just how difficult it was to get a conferencing software like Jitsi running across the world? Um, what it took to get there, and and what it takes today to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so the um, you're right. It, it did take 20 years to to get to to where we are, um, and I suppose that in and of itself is part of the the difficulty. Um, what, uh, you know, um, notable parts of our history is that um, when we started this project, um, I was in my master's, and it was it was not a vision for you know let's make the world a better place in this specific way, and we were imagining people communicating in that way. Some project get established that way, um, some um, follow a different thing. It was a, a passion of having a software within that field um, and a set of values, uh, the values around freedom of choice. Um, I should be able to run whatever I want to run under the conditions that I want to run it. And um, I, I, my, my expectations should not be uh, mismatched. I should be able to run exactly according to my expectations. With these values, the software went through many, many uh, transformations. Until it, uh, in its early years, one of the main issues that we were encountering was how difficult it was to use GT. That was before it entered the world of web. It was just a client that you could run and you could have audio video conversations and chat. And it was extremely hard to get regular people to use it because they had to understand that they needed to connect to certain services. Some of them were using SIP, some of them were using XMPP, even knowing what that is, is, is quite a challenge for, for most people. Um, getting into the world of web kind of allowed us to uh, provide a full solution. Look, we we have you just go to a URL and and you start working. Now, um, what it takes to um, run a service that provides video really depends on well how popular your service is and how many people are going to be using it and where these people are. To begin with, you know if it's just going to be you and a few friends, uh, that's easy to do. It, you can go on DigitalOcean on some such and and get a server for five dollars a month and run it there, and it will be fine. It would have taken you 15 minutes to deploy it. Now, let's say that it's not just you and a few of your friends, but it's uh, you and your school. Well, then maybe you want to have you know, multiple services and a little bit more of a complicated deployment um, so that if, if you, know, you could scale the users over multiple instances, and if one of them falls, you want, you want the thing to be up again. And then let's say that you want, it's not just school, but let's say it's your international company you need to have it duplicated around the world. And let's say now that it's not just your international company, it is literally the entire world. Um, and then you have to have many, many uh, servers running to, to power. Um, so at, when, when the pandemic came and hit, uh, we went to running from a few tens of servers to 8,000 um, across the world, which was, you know, that's what it takes to... to to, to, when you have m millions of users using your service every day, um, it, and, and, and many of them simultaneously, it, that's just what it takes. Now, obviously, we've we've actually um, 
that's by the way a very painful bill to foot um uh, especially when there isn't a clear path from converting that into revenue for the company um so it's for us that's been the motivation to double down very diligently on optimizing any single aspect of the service so that it uses as little resources as possible from uh, from servers it's also been a reason to uh, find out ways in which we can actually well make money um, and and one of the ways that we found is to make ourselves useful to developers who want to de develop meaning services and um, GT is a good way to do that um, and to to this day however there's a lot of services running on we use um, you know Oracle for our servers so uh, all around the world um, in, in in all on all continents we have uh, well we don't have anything in Antarctica but other than that it's uh, all continents um, running all the time um, so that wherever you would join uh, you would be identified as belonging to um, one geography or another so that you would be routed to that destination and then you would get resources there and if someone else joins maybe from another continent uh, they would connect to servers there and then the two servers would start talking to each other um, so one of the things that it takes is not just money but also constant observation of the patterns of communication so that you can Notice, for example, that you have cross-continental calls, and um, you need to to make sure that um, you know in order for everyone to get a better experience, they get servers that are close to them. Then these servers uh, have to connect uh, over you know good connections, um, so that the latency isn't uh, isn't as bad as that. And um, yeah, I, I would say observation of 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 the usage of the usage patterns is. Is a pretty key component here, and that, by the way, often gets in conflict with, at least in people's minds, um, with with privacy. When the minute you say I'm observing the usage of my service, that might raise some rate flags. Well, what do you mean observing? What exactly are you observing? And um, again, our values are to um, such that we we are extremely careful not to infringe on, not to do anything that people wouldn't want us to do, that we ourselves wouldn't want other people to do to us. Um, but you do have to keep your eyes open if if you want to adjust to whatever it is that people expect from the service. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's been quite a journey. One of the one of the big problems with privacy services is keeping them going because a lot of people in the privacy community expect free things. They don't want to have that credit card transaction. Um, there's just kind of an ethos of of FOSS and and etc. And if if you're listening and you run or are interested in ri running a privacy service or especially a digital privacy service. I know Emil has uh, spoken quite well and, and eloquently and has a lot of experience that he taps into when he talks about how uh, how you might go about that to be both profitable and have a, um, have a product that is free for most of the end users. I, I wonder if you guys could just give us a, a sense of the, the scale uh, of Jitsia uh, for my own curiosity, to be honest, but also to get us Give us a sense of how much this is growing and how it will hopefully be with us for a while. Like how many how many users are there on, on Jitsi? Like how many terabytes are are being processed any day? You have any statistics off the top of your head for us to get a sense of the scale? We we, we have a, f a, a few, but uh, keep in mind that um, as, as soon as people download the software to run it themselves, um, we know nothing. From from that point on, from the point that the download concludes, we we know nothing. So we know that <laughs> the users on me GT fluctuate. The maximum that we've reached so far was during the pandemic at twenty million. It it has fallen since, just with any um, video conferencing services. Um, luckily, by the way, because I think we were over reliant on on video conferencing for a lot of things that um, you know where where it's not optimal. But um, that aside, um, there's also uh, according to Docker Hub. There has been 20 million, 25 million downloads of of Jitsi from uh, from our Docker repositories. There, um, from our Debian repositories, there are about two million downloads a year. Um, so we seem to have a pretty healthy crowd out there uh, pro providing the Jitsi service, not just using it, but but also providing it for whatever communities um that they're they're maintaining and um hopefully we'd be able to keep that going yeah I, I hope so if you're listening remember contribute to 
projects that you like, privacy projects, and you can contribute not just monetarily, but by reaching out, seeing seeing what kind of programming might be needed, etc. Spreading the word, of course, is an easy thing to do. Um, as a final question, I kind of want to wrap in two questions, and then, of course, please uh, give me your final thoughts um, uh, afterward. Uh, you know what, what's next for for Jitsi? Uh, I, we see the rise of VoIP services. A lot more people are communicating over internet as opposed to SMS or or the previous methods of communication. What what do you see just generally and and specifically for Jitsi in in the upcoming five or ten years? Uh, th- th- these are always fascinating questions because there's things that we find fascinating now, uh, but we're also always very mindful to. What is it that users need from us? Um, now, uh, one thing that w- that is like a, a never going effort is always more pixels in less bandwidth, uh, so that you would get better and better quality, um, you know, cl- clearer and clearer audio. Um, so that's 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 always a thing. Uh, more and more people being able into a conference. We're about to finish support for uh, ten thousand participants in a. Um, in, in a room so that you would start being able to use Jitsi for some of the more live streaming case scenarios, but in actual real time with, with no delay. We are um, also always looking for, this is probably less sexy from uh, an end user perspective, but we're um, very concerned, always has been have been very interested in making it easier for people to deploy this. Because I think... That, that this is really the right privacy answer uh, for, for many people. Because uh, again, I we, we could maybe delve into this some other time. Um, th- you know, there's a lot of common, a lot in common between a, a, between our, our approach to privacy and a, and a religion. And I don't say this in a bad way. Religions are what got us to survive through through history. And, and the, the thing about religions is that um, it is essentially a solution to our inability to you know, backtrace our our our, our uh, problems. Um, you know, it's it's you know you cannot go through life um, knowing exactly what every step of your life is going to to lead to. You know, there are unpredicted outcomes all the time, and it's unbelievable complexity. Uh, so you end up with certain ground rules, and you know that if you follow follow these ground rules, things turn out for the better. Um, then. Than if you don't, that's you know that's how you end up with the, the the mainstream religions that survive, and the ones that don't survive are because well the people who use them didn't survive and and what. But let's not get into that too much. Um, it's it's a similar situation with privacy. It is such a complex problem because it is privacy f- to who, from what, uh, what what things are a problem to you, what needs do you have, what compromises are you ready to do, in what part of your life are we talking, are, are we discussing here. Um, and and there's these are all different. They're not they're not always understood. Sometimes you end up with absurdities like you know the uh, buying indulgences from the Catholic Church. Uh, you know so those those things also exist in the um, in in the world of privacy. People would go in and jump through up through absurd hoops. That well, you know that if you look at the GDPR um, legislation in Europe and one of its incredibly annoying side effects of having to click on a button on every website that you go to when this literally buys you nothing in terms of privacy is 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 one you know ex- good example of unfortunate side effects of uh, you know the, the complexity of privacy so w- to go back to Jitsi, we are trying to come up with ways for people to reach their privacy objectives better we're trying to um, for example one of the projects that we're thinking about is what if you know, we let you get the easy stuff from us. Um, um, you, you, you take our signaling servers, the, the web code and all of that, you rent yourself so that any negotiation of privacy happens on components that you control. And then we let you use our infrastructure for all the heavy stuff, like the actual traffic of video. But video goes through the, that end-to-end encrypted with keys negotiated by you so that it truly... You, you get that separation of actors again. You know the the thing that that you're protecting from, uh, which would be us, uh, does not know anything about uh, the negotiation of your of, of your private case. So uh, that's also one thing. And then also privately, I'm very uh, hopeful uh, about the development in in the developments in AI. I think there's interesting solutions down the road 
um, with regard to meetings that could come from AI. Now, there's a huge challenge there, which is that AI usually requires a lot of computing resources, which are usually available on the cloud. Um, and I don't know how we would go about that. You know, how, how would you leverage all these resources we, without requiring your, all of your stuff to be looked at by servers that you do not control? We'll, we'll see about that. But what I'm hopeful there is that there's a bigger problem with meetings altogether, um, uh, and which is that there's just too many of them. Uh, and especially in, in, in organizations that scale to certain sizes, it becomes... Um, you know, and getting everyone on the same page, getting everyone to have the same story about what it is that we're doing within this company and where are we going, starts requiring an impossible amount of full mesh communication between all sorts of different parties where you end up, um, the, the effort that it takes to be on the same page starts surpassing by a multitude uh, the actual effort of whatever it is that the company the effort to build whatever it is that the company is delivering. So I'm hoping that um, the development in AI can maybe help us have less meetings as well. Um, although that is at this point much more of a hope than it is a specific project. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm very appreciative to both of you for talking to my audience about Jitsi. I would encourage everybody listening, if you haven't used Jitsi Meet, search for Jitsi Meet, go give it a try. If you can't use your private messenger signal, etc. It's a fantastic option for scenarios where you um, where you can't use those. And uh, uh, yeah, Saul, did you have any final thoughts? I just wanted to share maybe something uh, more short term uh, rather than, than a vision for the for the future, uh, especially because it's in line with uh, with the topic of the conversation today, which is we will be uh, we will be releasing some some improvements to our end to end encryption uh, soon in the form of uh, user verification. Uh, if you have used Matrix, uh, should be familiar. So you'll be able to verify that the other user is who they claim to be, or rather that they are in possession of, of, of that user's keys by comparing you know, emoji or, or a bunch of numbers. And this will give you the, the, uh, the extra assurance that there was never a man in the middle uh, in that conversation. So. Uh, the long, the, the, the road of end-to-end encryption is long and uh, we're working through it. Perfect. Saul Emil of Jitsi, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having us.